Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mary Ann Monteleone, Vice President of Professional Development. And we'd like to welcome you to our Wednesday webinar as we celebrate April as Fair Housing Month. Every webinar during the month of April is dedicated toward equal and fair treatment to all seeking housing. And we have a great and accomplished lineup of speakers, starting with today's speaker, Sahar. Siddiqui, and um, I'd like to formally introduce her. So forgive me for reading, but I don't want to leave out anything. Um, so Sahar Siddiqui is Director of Fair Housing Policy and Valuation for the National Association of Realtors. She began her career working as a securities attorney in New York before joining the DC housing and finance world. Currently, she works on property valuation, fair housing, and federal loan financing issues for NAR. She holds a BA from the Ohio State University and a JD from the University of Michigan Law School. We are thrilled and honored to have her with us. So welcome Sahar and I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Marianne. And thank you everyone at LIBOR for having me here today. Um, I'm, I'm really engaged and excited to talk to you about fair housing um, from the NAR perspective today. And so what uh, I'm hoping to give to you today is just sort of a general update on the fair housing policy programs and initiatives that we're working on here at NAR. So before I start, I wanna thank Marianne so much for that great introduction. Um, I'm just gonna caveat that while I did go to law school, I am not a fair housing lawyer and nothing that I share with you today in my presentation, um, answers to questions I give should be relied upon as legal advice. Um, I know that um, LIBOR uh, has a great fair housing resources on their webpage. It's lirealtor slash fair housing. And if you have sort of those more fact specific, legally focused questions, um, while I'm happy to hear them and give commentary on it, um, you might find better answers through some of the resources on the website just mentioned. And of course, I'm sure you can always reach out to the great staff at LIBOR and they'll send you in the right direction as well. So let's just talk a little today. So as you can probably tell from a lot of the recent resources and actions and announcements coming out of NAR, fair housing has truly become a priority for the organization. We actually have three staff that comprise our fair housing advocacy team. So that's myself, Sarah Siddiqui, Director of Fair Housing Policy and Valuation, as well as our VP of Policy Advocacy, Brian Green. And we recently hired Senior Policy Representative Alexia Smokler on board as well. Alexia's um, great claim to fame is she is the brains behind Fairhaven, which I'll be getting into later. As this team, we work across NAR. We work with staff in education and media, diversity and inclusion areas, and so many other places to ensure that fair housing is not being siloed off in one little area, but that it is truly being considered in NAR with everything NAR is doing as an entity and in what we're providing for you, the realtors as well. So I do encourage any of you to reach out to me with any questions that if we don't get answered here in uh, this program, um, my email is ssiddiqui at nar.realtor. And at the end, I'll put it in the chat box so you can see it as well. So let's talk about NAR programs. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about the past. So a little over a year ago, NAR created its first ever Fair Housing Policy Committee. That is our member volunteers. They meet twice a year at um, our annual conferences and throughout the year to engage on matters and actually help develop the policy stances that NAR will carry forward in all our advocacy and work that we do. In addition, they created a director of fair housing policy position. This is something NAR didn't have before. And that was actually what uh, Brian Green was originally hired to do. Brian had spent roughly 20 years at HUD, um, basically leading up to becoming the head of enforcement there. So, I mean, he is a great resource. And the fact that he is with the realtors, he's with NAR is great for you guys. It's great for us. Well, 
A little something interesting did happen though, about three weeks into Brian being the director of fair housing policy in December of 2019 that I know you all here at LIBOR are very aware of, the News Day investigation. I'm not going to go into the particulars of that. I, I'm very certain everyone here knows what's going on, and I know that your association, LIBOR, has been working really hard, engaging at the state level and the local level on developing best practices and addressing all the items that came out of there. But from the NAR perspective, what I want to say is that it really made us stop, think, and realize that we needed to do better. And they are needed to do better in terms of providing fair housing training, education, and understanding to you, our members. So Brian and the people's room at the time, they came up with what you see on the screen, ACT. ACT stands for Accountability, Culture Change, and Training. It is a comprehensive effort to truly bring fair housing and the ideals of fair housing into all elements that NAR and realtors touch. So what do we wanna do? We wanna make sure that real estate professionals are being held accountable. That's the A in ACT when they violate fair housing laws. We also wanna make sure that fair housing is something that is inherent in how realtors treat clients and engage in their communities. Equal service should be woven into the way we serve clients, consumers, communities, the public, boards that realtors sit on, nonprofits that they volunteer at. I mean, it really should be everywhere. That, that's part of the culture change. Um, and when we say what realtors hold themselves up to a high ethical standard that we stand by our code of ethics, fair housing is core to that and must continue to be core to that. It really is a guiding force in all the business and transaction dealings we're doing. Making home ownership available to the broadest possible group of qualified buyers is good for business, it's good for communities, it's good for the American economy as a whole. So let's talk a little about these three things and how they've actually played out at NAR. So I have a couple of recent actions. I make myself laugh when I see that. No one else has to laugh, but I do. Um, I thought it was very clever. But so here, you know, recent actions. And I'm going to start with a couple of accountability items that I assume you might have heard about. Well, one of the really, really big things uh, that happened was at the, I'm going to say the 2020 um, annual conference. No, no, sorry, not 2020. It would have been a 2019 November conference which was held virtually, the NAR Board of Directors made the historic change by extending the application of Article 10 in the Code of Ethics to discriminatory speech and conduct outside of members' real estate practices. This is new standard of practice 10.5, which states that realtors must not use harassing speech, hate speech, epithets, or slurs against any protected classes under Article 10. So you, so you know the protected classes under Article 10 are race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, national origin, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Now, of course, this standard of practice, you know, got a lot of attention in the media, but you, the members, you actually helped develop it. Um, I, I remind everyone when I talk to them that the board of directors, these aren't people hired by NAR. These are the volunteer leaders. These are realtors in their communities who have worked their way up. They've become the directors and sort of think about it as like your elected representatives almost. And they, you know, decided this, this matters. This is important. Realtors, realtors, we, we need to stand up and show that we follow Fair housing, and we're exemplary in our communities. Um, I will say, because people do ask, is that, you know, have a lot of realtors, you know, been fined under this or been admonished under this new standard of practice 10-5? And I'll say it's, it's, it's not a lot. I don't have the numbers. And, you know, there's been a few, but it really, really hasn't been that many, which I, I'm very pleased and proud to note that. That, again, I, I say this over and over again, is that, Realtors, they want to do right by their communities. They want to ensure that there is fairness in housing. 
And so this is this just goes along with that. Also in November, um, actually on current NAR president Charlie Opler's first day in office, he did something very interesting. He issued a formal apology for NAR's past actions that had contributed to discrimination, redlining, and essentially just unfair practices and violations of and what would now be violations of the Fair Housing Act, but obviously at the time wouldn't have been. It was a really big moment. It was one that got caught up in the press quite a bit. But what was interesting was that it wasn't wasn't spur of the moment. It was something that had been in development for quite a while. For many years, NAR has been working to really strengthen how they view fair housing. I won't bore you with all the details. You can go to NAR.realtor to see that. But you know, just the most recent thing of adding gender identity to the Article 10 protected classes. You know, realtors, realtors are really getting to the forefront of fairness in this country. And that's a good thing because again, as I mentioned, the one thing about a realtor is very often they're the leaders in the community in one way, shape, or form. So what about culture change and training? Well, these are sort of interesting because they kind of intertwine and some things that our culture train, sorry, our culture change can also be a little bit about training and a lot of the work that's training really does lead to culture change. Well, so I'm gonna talk about one thing that we're working on, which is brokerage self-testing. So NER is in the development of creating a program that we can offer to our members, our brokerages across the country who want to voluntarily test themselves for potential discrimination among their employees, among their agents. This will allow them to uncover and address problems before a newspaper or a private fair housing group does it for them. We're working on developing a methodology and infrastructure that will allow any interested brokerage to raise their hand and say they want to do the right thing. They wanna make sure they're doing the right thing, but you know, it's a lot to have to do on your own. So if NAR can provide the tools and the ability to do it, we, we want to. We're working with council at the national level, but also with local councils in some of the uh, sort of testing areas or localities that we're working on, because obviously there's a lot of fair housing rules that are at the state and local level as well, just to ensure that everything is being done right, that whatever the tool ends up looking like, it is useful and it's helpful and it's correct. Most importantly, it's got to be correct. The goal really is just going to be that if you as a, your brokerage wants to get tested, that'll happen and then they'll receive a confidential report and that is key, confidential. These aren't meant to be findings that, you know, anyone can use for this way or the other. So the goal then is to see that those findings are just for your brokerage. You can see what's there and then depending on those financings, you know, provide access to training and other remediation measures to correct what other problems that might be found. And I also wanna say that there may not be problems and, and it still might be worthwhile, you know, to test your brokerage because there is a benefit in also knowing that the brokerage is doing the right thing. They've, they've trained their agents well, they're, you know, following the rules well, there's a satisfaction with just having everything being done right. Uh, we're also looking at um, a review of licensure laws of all 50 states. So kind of looking at fair housing and enforcement um, at the state level. So what we want to kind of develop is an online program that essentially you, you would, a state AE probably most likely would be the intended person, but, you know, perhaps an individual member would like to do that. But they can go in and they can actually compare their state's fair housing laws with another state's fair housing laws and then see where there might be gaps, where there might be room for correction. Just, just really have that tool at their disposal anytime they're working on strengthening fair housing laws, or anytime they're working on lobbying efforts in their state as well. Again, because this is you know, a sensitive and legal undertaking, we're working with outside councils to create this online platform. And the hope is that it will be done in the near future. We're actually really hopeful. This is something that might come out this year and then it can be an easy to use tool um, and just, you know, again, just be part of that process of really figuring things out. 
In addition, you know, we want to make sure that we are also recognizing all the good that's been happening since, you know, people have really started taking fair housing seriously. You know, we're working on a video series of realtor fair housing champions. These are realtors in the communities who have embraced fair housing um, in their life and as part of their business strategy, because I mentioned it before, it's good business. Getting qualified people into homes, no matter their background, no matter what they look like, no matter what might afflict them, is good for business, it's good for the community, it's good for the economy. And we're working on finding additional ways to acknowledge realtors who are fair housing leaders. We wanna make sure that if you're doing the right thing, you're getting recognized for it. That's gonna help shift the culture of our industry to one that applauds and celebrates fair housing. We shouldn't only be something that people are afraid of. It should be something that's celebrated. So, we're hoping to do a lot more there as well. Um, we're still working on more trainings as well. Um, I want to say last June, we had a 50 minute training video on implicit bias in real estate that's actually available on our website and aired our realtor. Implicit bias is the way that our brains automatically and without conscious awareness associate stereotypes with people. So that even as you know, we consciously know that we don't want to discriminate, we don't intend to discriminate, that implicit, that unconscious bias, you know, can come in and kind of muddle it up. So these are just tools to really try and get at that and to ensure that fairness and equal treatment are occurring no matter what. The hope is that the trainings will offer practical tools customized for the real estate context to help identify and overcome these hidden biases so everyone can be treated fairly. Um, as part of these videos, we also really want to develop a three-hour classroom on implicit biases that goes even deeper, more exercises, more tools. Again, this just goes back to going back to Newsday and everything that happened here on Long Island is, you know, NAR just thought as we need to do better. NAR needs to do better. We need to provide realtors, our members with more tools, more education. We need to create the kind of tools and education that really connect, really get in. So we're, we're trying it all. We've got so many different ways and we're working on it and, it and it's all for you and it's for your clients and it's for your communities. We actually are starting to pilot this particular training in three states. The goal is that it will be offered for CE credit because obviously that's very, very important. And of course, finally, um, something you might have heard about is a little training module we launched in November called Fair Haven, a fair housing simulation. Fair Haven is a new approach to fair housing training. It came about, again, in these conversations following everything that happened after News A and just figuring out how do we get good information out to as many realtors as we can that's easy to use, that's informative, and that's different. That's not just the same old watching a video and taking a quiz. Well, so one thing that we decided is that we really wanted to figure out how do we connect realtors to help them understand not just the, the facts of the fair housing law, but what it feels like to know fair housing, what it feels like, what, what it's like to be in a situation where you have to know, hey, is this a fair housing issue? Hey, how should I react in that? We wanted real life situations where the laws and the guidelines would come into play and you could kind of see for yourself how that could be done. So Fairhaven, if you haven't done it yet, it's not a lecture and it's not a reading followed by a quiz. It is a online simulation. Um, the, Ernst & Young actually helped us develop it. Uh, and it is uses storytelling to affect the learner's emotions. The scenarios in Fairhaven are based on real fair housing cases and on conversations we had with members. I urge all of you to go to fairhaven.realtor and engage with the program. Anyone with a nerd's ID can do it. I also know that um, you know, your leadership here at LIBOR is engaged in NAR President Charlie Oppler's Fair Housing Challenge, which includes having to complete Fairhaven as well as another program we have at home with diversity. Both again are on our website. I encourage you to go explore them, check it out, see what it's about. 
So I know that's a lot of information about the programs and I'm actually now gonna turn into a discussion more on policy and what's going on here in DC. But before I do that, I just wanted to take a break, check with Marianne to see if anybody has any questions specific to the programs before we move on. Um, looks like we're good. Um, Sahar, Sahar, we just have somebody who's commenting that I guess members should also know that what they say, even in their personal lives, counts. Yep, exactly. That is that is ten five. So if you make a yep. statement on your personal Facebook, if you tweet something that you know it doesn't even say you're a realtor, but it just it's got your name on it, you know that that can be a violation of ten five if we find that you know it violates. Um, you know, discrimination um, as, as we kind of view it from the NAR perspective. And, you know, and I want to be clear that this is an NAR um, code of ethics issue, right? Like this is not something that government is going to come and get you on. This is something that as an association, you know, we want to make sure everybody's following our code of ethics. We want to make sure realtors are upholding themselves well. And, and it goes to that. So no, that's a great thing to point out. That should be very, very clear. Um, okay, well, so yeah, and somebody's no, just asking for the Fair Haven link again, which is on our our website, so I can let them know. Um, yeah, you know, LARealtor.com forward slash um, Fair Housing, and the Fair Haven link should be there, but you can also explain how to get that. Yeah, it's super easy. It is literally fairhaven.realtor. So Fair Haven is all one word. F A I R H A V E N and then dot realtor and it will take you right there. And like I said, all you need to be able to do that is your nerds ID. You got your nerds ID. You can go in, you can do Fairhaven. Um, I know that we actually, we have some really cool updates coming out. I believe if it hasn't already rolled out, it should in the next week or so that you'll get a, a certificate that will let you show that you've completed it. So um, they're also working on creating a way that associations can check and see, you know, how many members within their association have completed it. So we're really excited to sort of get some of these updates out that'll make it a little bit more useful, we think as well. So no, great. And, and again, if anybody thinks of any questions, like I'm gonna, this wasn't your only chance, we're gonna have questions at the end as well. So, but I just yeah. wanted to stop and make sure that if anything had come up. Thank you. Okay, you can now continue. I think that's it. All right, great. So that is the programs, right? But that's just half of my presentation. Uh, another big element of what I do and what NAR does is advocacy. I'm actually in the advocacy department. Um, I, I work on policy much more so than I do on programs. And NAR is, again, really focused on our policy and making sure that all our policies, you know, include fair housing as an idea. And so one thing, you know, I want to think about is um, the sort of umbrella that we are sort of going to be operating on for spring that I just wanted to share with everyone here. And, you know, we have sort of three kind of ideas that for our May meetings, which some of you are probably aware of, which are our legislative meetings, um, they're, they're usually combined with virtual Hill visits now, but in the past real life Hill visits, we have these three areas that we're, we're kind of focusing how we think about our policy. And the first one is ensure fair housing for all. And it's pretty simple and it's exactly what you think. What are all the myriad of ways in legislation, in regulation, in policy ideas that fair housing is being insured for everybody? Because at a minimum, you'll wanna stop discrimination, right? Like the bare minimum of the Fair Housing Act in its test is stopping discrimination. But then we also wanna talk about, well, so we've stopped it, but how do we fix discrimination? And that's a different question. You know, that goes into issues of legacy. That, that goes into ideas of something you might be hearing a lot about, um, this term equity, um, which is a little different than equality, but not by much. It's the idea, they're both about fairness. Um, but equity talks a little bit more about fairness in a historic context. I talk to people about relay races. So let's say you've got a relay race, right? You've got four runners, 
they're all supposed to start at the same time. And then, you know, if somebody's faster than someone else, that team wins. But let's say you hold one of those legs of the relay race back. Let's say at the start, you keep one of those racers back. Well, you know, the next leg, right? The next person following that, they, they may not be being held back, but they were still hurt by the fact that their teammate was forcibly kept back. And I mentioned that as a way to think about some of the things you might be hearing me talk about. Um, when we're talking about improving fairness. You know, it's not about trying to be unfair to anybody by any means. It's about if we were unfair, if we discriminated in the beginning and that continues to have an effect, an unfair effect, well, how do we fix that? So, you know, the other thing to think about too is the reality of this market as well. Um, you know, one of our big areas that we're looking at is improving access to home ownership. I know one of the things I'm sure you're all very aware of is it's a tough market right now. Demand is high and supply is incredibly low. It is really hard for a lot of people who are solid borrowers, who have access to completely reasonable financing like an FHA loan to get into the market these days. Um, I'm often told that it is all cash or it is all conventional and that's it and nobody else is getting in. Yesterday's market doesn't work if today's market only the elites can get homes, only the really wealthy. That's a problem, right? That's not fair. And so we really got to think about that. We want to improve access for all communities, for all people, so that they can get into home ownership. We also want to build strong and resilient communities. So then we're talking about beyond just the purchase of a home. We're talking about infrastructure. We're talking about roads. We're talking about safe water, um, flood insurance in some areas, right? It's a big one. These are all things that are sort of this, this guiding force that we're looking at at NAR right now. And then the other big element that's the guiding forces at NAR are the data. Data tells us what we need to know and what we need to do. So I've got a few key facts and figures up here for you all to look at, but I'm going to read a few more just so you kind of get that bigger picture of what's going on. So I think without a doubt, the biggest thing right now is supply is incredibly low and demand is incredibly high. Properties are typically on the market for 20 days this February compared to 36 days last February. February sales of existing homes rose 9% from the February before. The national median existing home price for all housing types rose to $313,000, up from 15.8% a year ago. I, I'm just, that that price stopped me in my tracks. Now, I know I, I actually lived in um, this New York City for a while. So I know obviously your prices are quite high um, in your area generally, but you know, across the country, I mean, that that is an astonishing number to be a median home price. And home prices are just, they keep escalating. Um, this was actually the 108th consecutive month of year over year gains. And prices are just going up, 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 up. And again, coupled with that is the inventory. So compared to February this year, last year, there was a 29.5% drop in inventory. That's almost a third less homes available for people to purchase. It marks 21 straight months of decline in supply. Right now, it takes about two months to move all of the current inventory we have. That terrifies me. I don't know if it terrifies you, but that from a, from a fair housing perspective, from a housing generally perspective, I find that number terrifying. So I want to talk a little bit more about home ownership right now. Um, just for your background, the total U.S. home ownership rate was 64.2% in 2019. These are the numbers we have, most recent. Um, but when we break that down uh, by race, um, the picture is a little different. Uh, white, non-Hispanic white Americans were actually in home ownership at 69.8%. That's above the national average. The Black American home ownership rate, though, was 42%. That is a gap of almost 30%. In addition, the home ownership rates for Asian Americans uh, were 60% and Hispanic Americans were 48%.
Black applicants were rejected for mortgage loans at a rate two and a half times greater than white applicants. And nationwide, 43% of Black households can afford to buy a home compared to 63% of white households. In addition, Black households are more than twice as likely than white households to have student loan debt at 43% versus 21% with the median student loan debt for a black household of 40,000 compared to 30,000 for white households. In almost every survey we do when we talk to home buyers and we ask about hurdles to purchase, it's down payment connected to student debt loan. It is one of the most noted burdens that home buyers face in terms of trying to get into that down payment and into that house. In addition, Black applicants were rejected for mortgage loans two and a half times greater than white applicants. And it, another problem um, is source of funds for down payment. Black and Hispanic Americans were three and two times as likely compared to white and Asian Americans to tap into a 401k or pension funds to find down payment source. Uh, this, you know, Hearing that is it, very, very troubling um, to me. Obviously, owning a home is a great source of wealth generation and savings accumulation, but it shouldn't come at the cost of other forms of wealth generation and savings accumulation that only works to negatively impact wealth growth. Comparatively, uh, four out of 10 white Americans were just able to use the sale of their primary home to purchase the secondary home. But only 18% of Black Americans and 21% of Hispanic Americans were able to do that. So now all that, that's sort of, that's the data NAR has kind of painting the picture of how it looks right now, painting the picture of this home ownership gap when we look at people of color and who has homes, who doesn't homes, who has access to financing, who doesn't, who is facing burdens where. That's current. One thing NAR tends not to do is, look, is kind of guess about the future, but I was recently reading something from the Urban Institute and, and they, they do projections into the future. And I wanted to share it today because I think it, it's something we all need to be thinking about. So because these are future projections, I just wanna make very clear, this is not current data. This is speculation, it's educated speculation, but it, but it is speculation. So the Urban Institute, which is um, a nonprofit think tank entity based in DC, um, Basically, their projections are that household growth will continue to be weak for the next two decades, so between 2020 and 2040. They believe that while there will be 16 million new households over the new tech decades, um, about and half of them will be Hispanic, so you're seeing growth, um, the overall rate of growth will be negative. So that's kind of one of those funny numbers where you are getting more homeowners technically by the numbers, but the percentage of people in homeownership is going down, right? Because the population is increasing just generally. The concern is especially harsh when we are looking at projections for Black Americans. There's thought that roughly 1 million Black households will miss out on homeownership opportunities in the next two decades that they normally looking at past, you know, sort of these slices of time would have been able to have it. Um, it's very concerning to think that there might be a group that is more renter than homeowner in across all their age demographics too, which is older age, millennial, Gen Z, what have you, but it affects a lot. It affects not just the personal wealth generation, but to think about what that effect has on communities, what it has on schools, what it has on stability. It is very clear that if we don't address some of the disparities that I, NAR and I has you know done research on and I mentioned that there could be a much lower home ownership rate in the future and the wealth generation and stability consequences, especially you know, Black Americans, um, pretty, pretty terrible, frankly, pretty, pretty scary. So now you will be asking, well, on that, you know, uplifting note, um, what does this have to do with fair housing? Well, again, as I mentioned before, you know, fair housing 
the idea is that to ensure that all Americans can enjoy the benefits of the housing market. They can enjoy ownership. They can enjoy wealth building, community, security, um, strength in education. Real estate is our industry. You know, so we, we are the ones who should be ensuring that fair housing is available, is out there for everyone. So what is NAR doing? Well, talk about it. So NAR, as I mentioned, you know, we want to ensure fair housing for all. Um, so we're actually working with other industry groups. We're working with consumer advocates like the National Housing Conference, trade groups like the Mortgage Bankers, um, our friends in NAREP and NAREB to develop legislative and regulatory solutions to this homeownership gap that I've discussed. One of one of the solutions is that we've engaged in something called the Black Homeownership Collaborative. It is a coalition of groups and associations led by the National Housing Conference and the National Fair Housing Alliance. Um, uh, Brian Green, you know, our VP of advocacy, he's also part of, part of the head team in that. And they're developing a series of proposals, draft legislation that touches on so many aspects of the housing process. Um, there's a lot actually looking at lending, down payment access, savings, student debt, uh, just coming up with outside the box ideas to really figure out like, how do we solve, you know, this, this, this pretty large issue? You know, it's sort of looking at, for example, so one that I've worked on personally, um, I've been working on developing um, an idea for a government sponsored down payment assistance program. Um, right now, many down payment assistance programs, you know, they're, they're, they're private or they're state. Um, the federal government isn't as directly involved. And there are difficulties with that, right? Because you have to ensure that you are following the Fair Housing Act and being fair. But, you know, it, it's coming up with these sort of ideas and these ways to sort of make things work to, to improve diversity, for example, in our lending institutions, to improve access to credit to help foster acceptance of alternative forms of credit. For example, looking at rent payments rather than just credit cards. You know, we're, we're talking to offices on Capitol Hill for simple changes in programs that already exist. Um, so as I mentioned, I work on federal housing programs. So I work on FHA. Uh, you know, I don't know how many people are aware, but the way FHA calculates um, student debt, they don't actually look at how much a person pays. They don't look at their monthly payment. They have this sort of formula that they use to determine, oh, this is what your debt is with student loans. But, you know, that doesn't seem fair to me and it's not fair to NAR. Um, what you pay is what you pay on a student loan. And that is what should be considered if you're looking at somebody's ability to repay a mortgage as well. So it's a very, it's actually a very simple, easy fix. And that's something that can there. And there's lots of things like this across, across so many programs and laws. And it's sometimes these, these small changes, these small little things that we at NAR are really devoting like time and energy and research into working to improve because that net gain of making these small changes could mean a lot for overcoming a lot of these gaps in home ownership. Um, you know, and I have to say that, you know, one thing to note is that there's been a change in government. Um, obviously, you know, President Biden is now in power. The Democrats are actually in power in the House. Um, they're essentially in power in the Senate with um, the vice president delivering a deciding vote. It's a 50-50 split in the Senate right now, Republican and Democrat. And that, that affects um, what policies we see coming out of the Hill these days. For example, um, there were roughly 25 bills I've seen in the past two months come out geared purely at discrimination in lending and diversity in financial institutions. Um, a lot of those bills were just really simple changes of including a diverse board member at the Federal Reserve, the FDIC. Um, again, simple changes, as I mentioned, the student loan one at FHA, but, you know, with um, the, the GSEs and conventional finance, just, just little, little, little tweaks to how financing is done and how lending is done that you know, could hopefully have a big impact as it all comes together. There's a lot of talk about the federal loan programs, USDA, FHA, VA. These programs normally serve those borrowers that, bar borrowers that 
conventional lending left behind, right? And a lot of times the people who use those loans, you know, do fall into a protected class at the end of the day um, with the Fair Housing Act. And many of them cannot compete in the market right now. There's just, it's just too hard. There's just an idea that if you're using a VA loan or if you're using an FHA loan, it's not, it's not worth it. And that is troubling. And I don't begrudge, you know, a selling agent or a listing agent, you know, who's just sort of looking at what's the best offer for my client, right? I understand that there's, there's a business deal that has to be done and there's a seller there and that seller, you know, should go for what's going to be the best for them. I totally get that. So I don't think that's it. I'm not saying there's a problem with with people not choosing those loan products. I'm saying the problem is with the loan products that they need to be competitive. They need to be done in a way that isn't a disservice to the borrowers they're helping. You know, I will say that I also think you're going to continue to see a lot more focus on fair housing and this idea of fairness and this idea of equity. Um, through the rest of this administration. I'm just going to point out that, you know, some of the earliest things the Biden administration did was release a flurry of EOs. And I've highlighted two that kind of go more to the discussions we're having here. This first one, this uh, 13988, uh, essentially asked the federal agencies to look at discrimination on the basis of gender and sexual orientation in education, in employment, and housing. The result of this EO was that HUD actually issued a statement noting that they would enforce fair housing rules with the idea that gender identity and sexual orientation are part of the protected class. So they're not saying that they're now part of the Fair Housing Act, but what they're saying is that under the protected class of sex, they're going to now view that gender identity and sexual orientation fall under that, which means they're now in line with what NAR has been proposing. So that's we, we support that because we've been supporting that since 2009 and for um, sexual orientation and 2013 for gender identity. I will say that there's been a lot of discussion of the Equality Act. I think some of you might have heard about it. This uh, act recently passed the House and it was going to prohibit discrimination based on gender and sexual orientation in um, many areas, um, housing, but I think also education and some other areas. I will say just that while it passed the House, I we think that likelihood of Senate passage would be minimal, um, but it's a part of this ongoing conversation about what can be done and where can it be done and how do we just keep ensuring fairness in this country. For the next EO, 13985, that essentially focused on this idea of affirmatively advancing equality. And this is kind of what I was talking about at the top of this section where at the bare minimum, you stop discrimination, but then how do you correct it? How do you correct the harm that has been done by past discrimination? And this EO goes to that. And for housing in particular, what it did was HUD is now reviewing the affirmatively furthering for housing rule that the Trump administration had removed. Um, and those of you who might work closely with like your locality, um, you know, knew that this was a rule that the localities kind of had to follow in terms of housing and, you know, certain monies from HUD. Uh, the Trump administration kind of just basically pulled it away, um, but now it's sort of being reviewed again under this current HUD. Um, in addition, there was a rule on disparate impact that had been put out under the Trump administration. It was a proposed rule on how HUD should assess disparate impact given some recent court cases, including a recent Supreme Court case. Um, but that rule has now, again, also been pulled back and it's, it's being reviewed under this administration. And my guess is you'll probably see, maybe not this year, but you know, in the next four years, you will see regs coming out of HUD that touch on affirmatively furthering fair housing and disparate impact. And it'll be interesting to see how they look. I don't, I don't know what the particulars of it will be, but it's definitely something we're gonna be keeping an eye on here at NAR as well. Let's see. And then um, another thing I just wanted to touch on, um, I'm trying to do this quickly because I did want to leave time for questions as well. Um, a lot of you might have been hearing about allegations of bias in the appraisal process uh, when it comes to housing. So I've got two 
examples up on the screen just for your background. I'm not going to read it to you, but you know the basic idea is these sort of um, media stories is that you know a homeowner, um, usually black, I believe, but some form of minority, you know, had their home appraised and the value came in lower than all the neighbors in their community, and they you know, went through this, tried to figure out why, why, why. And what they came up against was there was discrimination in the appraisal. The appraiser came in with bias and gave them a lower value based on how they looked or how, how they looked in the photos in their home, you know, just by some idea of that. I will say that these stories have been gaining a lot of traction, but it's been good in that they've also been forcing an awakening in the appraisal industry itself. Now, some of you may or may not know is that actually um, NAR has appraiser members. We have roughly 25,000 realtors who are appraisers. They have a committee and they've been really actively engaged on this idea. So we, in conjunction with our appraiser members and also our fair housing members, have been working with other appraisal organizations to really kind of develop better training for appraisers as it comes to fair housing. You know, the appraiser doesn't interact the same way that an agent does, right? There isn't that same way that they interact with a buyer and seller. Their work is different. So while we, you know, for example, we have Fairhaven, which is great, but it's very agent focused, you know, so it may not be the best option if you're an appraiser or, you know, some other form of, you know, realtor that isn't an agent. So, you know, we're, we're, we're working with these groups, we're working to develop the forms of education that would address these problems, these instances that you see up on the screen and, you know, prevent them from happening in the first place. What another thing though, is that what these media stories have done is they, they've actually tapped into another question, another issue when it comes to value and homes and color, which is that on average, and there's research out there, um, Dr. Perry at the Brookings Institute has a lot of great research out that. Uh, the Federal Reserve, I want to say in, in Pennsylvania or Boston has some great research on that. But there's this idea that Black neighborhoods, Hispanic neighborhoods are just valued lower, flat out, than white neighborhoods. And you look at neighborhoods that might feed the same school district. You look at neighborhoods that are relatively the same access to transportation, those sort of elements. And yet the ones with people of color are just valued less. This is a sticky problem. This is a sticky problem because I think people want to go in and say, oh, well, they should just appraise them higher. Well, the rules of appraisal, um, the official rules of it, you know, there, there's limits to what the appraiser is allowed to do. There's limits to how much an appraiser can increase the value of a home, you know, because of, and because they have to define that, they have to provide the background every time, you know, they provide a value and they have to showcase it and whatnot. And so when you have a situation where the neighborhood, where the community, you know, is being valued less and that reasoning might, you know, if you really do all your digging, go back to redlining, go back to discrimination, go back to the fact that when we were building the highway system, we just chose to plow through majority black neighborhoods over majority white neighborhoods. It's a lot, it is a lot, it is a big problem and it doesn't have an easy answer, but it is a conversation that's going on right now. And it's one that I think is gonna keep going on and it's gonna tap into obviously where realtors um, come in, in terms of transaction, it's gonna tap into investors. It's gonna tap into the lending side. It's gonna tap into the government community side. And I bring it up because I think it, again, it's an example highlighting how much some of what we talk about fair housing and fairness, you know, it, it can go beyond just again, that basic thing of the act and of stopping discrimination and this idea of, how do we how do we now correct for the past? You know, how do we how do we truly make it fair? And let's see, I think we are at 1250. So I'm gonna stop because I want to make sure everybody has time for questions. And I'm um, I'm happy to take any. Um, so I can't see the chat right now, um, except I might just Marianne, is it okay if I just escape off of the screen share? Sure. Okay. 
All right, so yeah, please, um, I think, I was told that you guys normally put your, your questions in the chat, so I'm happy to take any that come through the chat. Um, there, there was an interesting statistic that you put up before um, about from 2020 to 2040, the majority of home buyers will be in minorities, uh, uh, predominantly Hispanic. I, I'm just curious, how, how did we come to that data and to that fact? Is, do you have any background on that? Yeah, so, so yeah, no, of course. So, um, so that is actually um, data from the Urban Institute. And the Urban Institute um, engages in projection studies like that. Um, NAR does not. And so I, I just, I like that question because I do want to make this, this, this very clear is that when you're, when you're dealing with projection studies, um, I mean, it really, it really is a bit of a guess. You kind of create a trajectory and assume that trajectory holds, that there aren't things that happen that change it and throw it off. So, you know, I, I don't work with Urban Institute. I was just reading um, this research that they have. So I wasn't a part of the development of it. Um, so I don't know all the ins and outs of where they created their baseline to then get this trajectory. I just know that this is the trajectory that they are showcasing. Mm -hmm. um, they are likely looking at the kind of research that I just put out about the NAR, where it's like, there's currently, um, a gap of almost 30%, right? So yeah. if that kind of, those numbers and that rate of growth continues, but then you pit it against the changes in population. Um, and so that's all sorts of complicated math that I as a lawyer don't no, do, no, no, no. <laughs> but it creates, that's sort of where you create it, right? Like that's kind of how you get it. It's like, you're looking at what you have now and you kind of input it in a way that it's guessing what that makes the future look like. Yes, that makes complete sense. Interesting fact. Um, very eye-opening, the different scenarios that you gave, you know, um, what's happened in the appraisal world and in the um, um, home loan example that you gave through examples. I think it's very eye-opening, the effects, um, you know, not only in showing homes, but also in the ancillary um, you know, um, programs and, and um, how it affects homeowners and minorities. It, it was an excellent program. I don't think we have any other further questions. So I, I wanna thank you for being with us. And um, we have the session recorded and we put it on our lirealtor.com forward slash COVID page along with our other webinars. So those who miss it, we will promote it and it will be there for them. I just want to say thank you in person. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. It was just great. And I hope to have you back again and work with you in the future. LIBOR members who are with us benefited greatly from your being here. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate it coming. And um, I put my email up in the chat if anyone has anything they want to follow up with me. And just I just want to reiterate that NAR, we, we are here. We are here as a resource for the association, for all the members. Please, you know, go to NAR.realtor, use what we have. Go to the wonderful website that LIBOR has created at LI Realtors slash Fair Housing. Um, reach out to me directly, you know, whatever it is. Like the point is we're here, we're here to help. Thank you. Thank you for being part of this um, and, and for offering your contact information. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have a good day. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for joining with us. And, and remember April is Fair Housing Month and every Wednesday we will host a speaker in support of fair housing and equal treatment for all. So we'll see you next week. Thank you again, Sahar. <laughs>